apply because Sam thinks that the city is kind of where stars are made. It's where he's going to achieve this goal of being an actor. So Sam's parents are pretty nervous about this idea, um, as I think a lot of parents can be <laughs> um, when their loved ones are in that transition time. Um, and they're concerned about Sam being taken advantage of because there's a lot of kind of life skills, independent living skills he hasn't had to do, um, like paying bills or budgeting. And Sam is very friendly and kind of just thinks that everybody he meets, everybody he talks to is his friend and, you know, wants the best for him. So Sam and his family uh, decided to use a supportive decision-making agreement to kind of outline the parts of Sam's life that he needs help in um, and kind of who's going to help him with those pieces and what that help looks like. So that way Sam still gets assistance or help, but keeps his rights and his independence and ultimately makes all final decisions on his own. Um, so that is Sam in a, in a nutshell again. <laughs> so your relationship tool is a visual way to map out who's in your life. And we're gonna look at family, friends, uh, people whose job it is to support you at home or other places, and people whose job um, it is to support you at school or work. Then you're also going to be looking at how close do you feel to these people. And we're not necessarily talking about physical closeness um, or geographical closeness. We're thinking about um, emotional closeness, trust, um, comfort, that kind of thing. So this is what the relationship map looks like. And it's a bunch of circles and lines, kind of like a web. Um, so your name goes in the middle um, because it's your relationship map. Now, this inner, the circle that is around your name circle is people who you feel closest to people that you really trust, people that are your go-to um, for support, for uh, kind of sharing your secrets, people you feel comfortable giving information to and getting information from. Then we have the next circle. And those are people that are still maybe important to you or part of your life, but they're not quite as emotionally close to you. Maybe you don't trust them with as much personal information as you do the people in the closer circle. And then you kind of have that outer ring. And this is, again, people in your life, but probably people that you don't feel as close to. You're not going to go to help um, it might be people that are paid to support you, but um, that paid relationship isn't maybe the best relationship. <laughs> um, they, it's, a, it's a service. It's not really, um, you know, a true support <laughs> if, you, if you kind of think about it that way. So we'll go uh, category by category with Sam. So for Sam, when we look at family, for Sam, April is his sister and his mom and dad. They are the emotionally closest to him, family-wise. They're people he trusts that he can go to. Then as you move on out to the next circle, he's got his Uncle Bill, his Aunt Sue, and his grandma and grandpa. You know, they're important to him, but they're not necessarily the people he's going to go to um, for important things in his life. He doesn't feel as connected to them. When it comes to people whose job it is to support me at work or school, Sam only has people in that inner circle. And that's Ms. Schwartz, his teacher, Ms. Jones, his vocational uh, teacher, and then Mr. Dunn, his counselor. Now, you might be thinking, oh, you know, a teacher, a counselor, like, are they really that close to him? This is Sam's relationship map. So this is all based off of how Sam feels. 
you know, Miss Schwartz or Miss Jones might not even have Sam on their own relationship maps. And that's okay. Um, because this, this is just Sam and what Sam feels. And for that matter, it's how Sam feels right now. Um, like the other tools we've talked about, they're kind of a point in time. So a relationship map, you know, might change over time based off of how relationships change. For people who support Sam at home and other places, in his closer circle, he's got Rachel, who's his ABA therapist, and Johnny, who's his theater coach. Um, that's outside of school. And then he's got Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor's his primary care physician who has been his primary care physician for pretty much his entire life. Um, so he feels like Dr. Taylor knows him pretty well, um, you know, knows what's going on in his life, but again, probably isn't somebody he's going to seek, um, you know, support and help from beyond maybe medical things, different medications, that kind of stuff. And then Sam's got a whole host of friends. Uh, closest to him, he's got Adam, Kara, Melanie, and Paul. And then outside of that, he's got Mike, Kim, David, Mark, and Sarah. Now, some of the people that are in Sam's friend category are also people that work with him at school. Um, they are people that help him out at school. But it's important when you're filling this out to make sure that you only put um, that one person in one spot. Sometimes there's overlap. Um, I know on mine, I have people that could fit in that support me at work, but are also my friends category. So I have to figure out which category do they fit best in. Um, if you list the same person multiple times, it kind of gives a false sense of how many people someone has in their life to support them. So you just wanna figure out which category you think fits best and then put them there and that's okay. So if you've got your relationship map, now you gotta kind of think about, great, here's all these people. Now what, who am I looking to, to support me? Because not everybody on here would be necessarily a good supporter. So what we say is to think about what decisions or choices that you need help with. So that might be the when do I want support tool, the tool that we filled out last week. Think about the things on there. The things that you said, you kind of put a check on that middle column or on the far right. So either things you can do, but with help or things you need somebody else to do for you altogether. What skills, information, knowledge are needed to help you with those specific tasks or decisions? And then from there, you can look at your relationship map and see, okay, who's on here that has the skills or the knowledge and is somebody that I trust and feel comfortable communicating with or working with, getting information from. So for Sam, he put stars around those people. So that was his mom, his dad, his sister, April, Rachel, his ABA therapist, Johnny, his theater coach, and then Adam, one of his friends. So those are six people that he decided they've got the information and the skills and the level of trust that I need to talk to them about the things that I need help with. So again, this is Sam's list of possible supporters, people that he will need to reach out to to ask them if they would agree to be supporters on his supporter decision-making agreement. So once you have that, you kind of have to sit there and say, okay, how do I ask somebody? It's a little intimidating. Uh, it can be scary. So I always say, Things you want to think about beforehand. It might be helpful to come up with a list or a script, if you will. So, so things to think about uh, could be what do you want that person to help you with? And this is gonna might look different from person to person. Um, 
or supporter to supporter. So what do you want them to help you with? How do you want them to help you? Again, that might be different. You know, I might want one person to come to appointments or doctor's appointments with me, but I want another person to help me research something. And that person, I definitely don't want coming to doctor's appointments with me. And then how often do you think you might need their help? Um, you know, sometimes people might say, yeah, I don't mind helping you, but how, you know, is this every day? What's this going to look like? Um, so it's helpful to give them a little bit of an idea if you can. If you can't, that's okay. Just be honest and say, I'm not sure. Um, but here's the kinds of things I want you to help me with. Here's how I want you to help me. And if you're comfortable with that, we can figure out the how often piece together. Again, you can use the discovery tools that we completed in weeks one and two, the when do I want support tool and the what kind of support do I want tool to kind of help with this. And then ways to ask for help. So you could write a letter, you could send an email, you could also talk to the person either on the phone or on face-to-face. -face. And we've got a little bit of some information again to think about if you're gonna talk to somebody. So things people might want to know. What is a supported decision-making agreement? What does a supporter do? What do you need or want them to help you with? Um, and then how do you want them to help you? Again, how often will they need to help you? And once you kind of have that conversation, then ask them and they, if they agree then to say, okay, can you meet with me so we can fill out the agreement together or we can review it together. And if you're comfortable, sign it as a supporter. Some things that can help with this conversation online, we have a frequently asked questions document that pretty much answers these questions for you as far as what is a supported decision-making agreement um, and what do supporters do? So that can kind of help with that piece with answering questions. We also have that information um, on the DBHDS supported decision-making website. I'll put that in the uh, chat box in a second. Um, so there's more information that people can get from there. Um, and then I also really recommend the what kind of support do I want tool, um, because that talks about how I like to be helped and also how I don't like to be helped. And that's helpful for anybody to know um, who you are asking to support you, just so they've got a good idea of, um, OK, you need more time when we're looking at decisions. So let's figure that out. You know, I'm not going to support you and expect you to give an answer right then or make a decision right then. You know, we might have to have several conversations and talk about this a little bit longer before you to um, make a decision. Or for that matter, maybe it's, um, you know, you don't want any help with paperwork. <laughs> that is not helpful to you. Um, you want to handle that on your own. Um, so I will not do anything that requires paperwork, or I won't even suggest things. Um, because if you're coming to me, you just want me to listen. And that's okay. Sometimes I can do that. Um, but to give additional advice, you don't want that. That's not helpful. We have a little bit of a uh, either script or letter template that people can use that just kind of, you know, says, that you're creating a supported decision-making agreement, you want them to be a supporter, and that a supported decision-making agreement is a document that I write that says who I want to help me and what areas of life I want help and how I want to be helped. It's a way for me to get the help with making choices or decisions, but I keep all my rights and make all final decisions. Supporters agree to help me how I like to be helped, but do not make decisions for me. And supporters can decide not to be a supporter at any time and do not get in trouble for the choices I make. So that might help answer some of the questions or concerns that somebody might have if you're asking them to be a supporter. You can also then provide more of those details. So I would like you to help me in these life areas, or I would like you to help me with these specific things. And you can use the different discovery tools to help that, uh, with writing that out. 
Um, and I would like people to help me by doing these specific things. Um, again, if you're okay with that, you know, please meet with me so we can fill out my supported decision-making agreement. You don't have to use this. It's just to kind of help give some prompts or idea of how to ask somebody. So that is where we are at. Uh, that's a, it's an fairly easy, it's not a complex tool. Um, it does take some time to think about, but, um, and I did see a question in the chat. So I wanna make sure I get to that real quick. Let's see here. It seems like an ABA therapist would have a conflict of interest as a paid professional for Sam. So great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so uh, in Virginia, yes, there are some states, I see your link, that do recommend um, or actually have restrictions saying who can and can't be a supporter. In Virginia, we chose not to put any um, restrictions or stipulations on who can or can't be a supporter um, because we wanted people to have more flexibility and freedom um, and not feel like uh, they couldn't decide for themselves who they wanted to support them. Now, we do have the caveat where we say that if somebody is paid to be a supporter or to support somebody in one part of their life and then is asking to be a supporter on a support decision-making agreement, they need to be very upfront about any conflict of interest and say that they can't provide support in those areas that could be a conflict of interest. Um, we have some uh, information, let me, I can pull that up um, on the website that can help with that. Uh, let's see here. So this is put it in the chat. This is the supported decision making page on DBHDS's website. Um, and if you go down to the support decision making agreement template and supplemental documents, we've got um, the FAQ document the support decision-making FAQ. And this explains um, all kinds of things about supported decision-making, supported decision-making agreements, um, the role of supporters, the role of facilitators, the role and rights of a decision-maker. Um, so again, you know, decision makers can say, hey, I don't want this person to be a supporter anymore. And supporters can remove themselves and say, this isn't a good fit. Um, but as of right now, Virginia doesn't have any uh, restrictions or rules on who can or can't be that supporter. Sarah, you kind of mentioned that several times <clears throat> about conflict of interest mm -hmm. um, through this process. So, um, but I think it's always helpful to hear it again. And I guess my biggest concern, well, one of my concerns is I think about so many people who only have paid people around them and it just emphasizes uh, to me how important helping people make connections and have connections with any remaining family or um, other people that they interact with. Yeah. Well, Lucy, and I think that, that brings up a good point. That was one of the deciding factors. Uh, this was a, a huge discussion in the work group that was, um, we spent, I think, almost a year um, working to figure out um, what supported decision making was going to look like initially in Virginia <laughs> um, and the documents and that, that we're reviewing now. Um, and that was one of the, the reasons that um, we ultimately decided not to have restrictions on who supporters could be because that would limit 
a whole group of individuals from actually being able to utilize supported decision-making agreements because they only have paid supporters. Um, so certainly the hope is that if that's the case, that we could utilize uh, things like community engagement or other, uh, other ways that people can develop those relationships, um, those more natural support relationships, and then maybe their agreement could change. And people, those paid supporters could move from being the supports to uh, filling in now with more natural supports um, in somebody's life. But yeah, it, it, it's a it's a challenge and it's a barrier. And we we really didn't want that to be a barrier for people utilizing supported decision making agreements um, and then being seen, you know, up, because you don't have any natural supports that could support you with this you know, then we're going to do like public guardianship or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So we were trying to make it as accessible as possible, but to also understand that, yeah, there, there is some, some concern um, that can happen with the conflict of interest piece. Well, it will be a great outcome for people if it helps them um, develop more relationships, et cetera. And of course I was on that work group and yes. I made that decision. <laughs> yes, I, I was gonna say people on this call were part of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you for, for pointing that out. And we looked at other states. Um, yeah, there's a lot of states that had different um, preferences, different formats, um, and we were kind of just trying to uh, figure out what what would work best for Virginia right now, um, and um, and I'm I'm not saying that there might not be changes in the future. Um, this is just kind of how how could we get uh, get started um, with this initiative. So, okay, if I can interrupt for just a second, yes. Because I, I will stop recording now oh, yeah. so people can um, ask questions. And um, this is the end of session three for supported decision making. We hope you're back with us next week. Stop recording. Yes, 